The Supreme Court accepts Trump's immunity case, and many people in the media are admitting that the J6 saga, the attempt to get a conviction for insurrection before the election, is now on life support. Andrew Weissman, former Trump prosecutor, made that same phrase. We'll talk about that. A lot of meltdowns from Rachel Maddow, Eli Mistel, Judge Luddig, who talks like a can of molasses. All of them freaked out because this is where all their eggs were in this one basket. But the problem is, even though they're very upset about this and they're saying Trump and the Supreme Supreme Court are colluding with each other to try to delay, 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 and Trump is trying to stall this out. It's all nonsense, okay? The fact is, this case has been accelerated unlike anything we've ever seen before, and we're going to go through the timeline and have ourselves a little reality check, courtesy of this attorney, called Dylan Esper on X. But we're going to see what the order says, make sure we have our timeline marked, and then we're going to hear what the media says. They're very sad, very depressed, that they're not going to be able to get this guy before the election on the insurrection charges. So, SCOTUS posted this. In the case of Donald Trump versus the United States. Very simple order. We're just covering it for posterity's sake. Saying here, the application for a stay that was presented to John Roberts is here, is referred by him to the court. Now, the special counsel, that's Jack Smith's request to treat the stay application as a petition for a writ of certiorari is granted. And that petition is granted limited to the following question. So it's almost like they're saying, hey, Jack, you win. We're going to do what you want to do. Aren't you happy? And so they accept it a little bit. It's kind of like underhanded to him. We're accepting your petition, not really Trump's. Whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? Great question. And I think the answer to that is a president does enjoy presidential immunity, and it's very broad, and that if you don't like an official act, you got to impeach them under the impeachment judgment clause. Then the immunity evaporates. Now, without expressing a view on the merits, this court directs the Court of Appeals to continue withholding issuance of the mandate. So in other words, Chutkin is not going to get the case back. So Jack Smith is like, Whoa! screaming at the sky Whoa! until the sending down of a judgment for this court and the application for a stay from Trump is dismissed as moot. So it's like, oh, we're dismissing Trump's request. But Jack, you win. And we're going to give you everything that Trump wants. Perfect. So the stay is granted. They're going to hear the case. And this case is going to be set for oral argument during the week of April 22nd, 2024. So mark your calendars, my friends. Petitioner's brief on the merits, that's Trump's, and any any amicus brief in support or in support of neither party are to be filed and respondents brief on the merit. And actually I think they're accepting Jack as the petitioner. So we got a bunch of stuff due by March 19th, by April 8th and by April 15th. So their briefs on the merits and any amicus curiae brief. So friends of the court brief. So like we've covered those here from Ed Meese and others are to be filed on or before Monday the 8th, the reply brief is due. And then of course we'll read all those briefs here and then we'll see what's happening on April 22nd for oral R arguments. And so it is causing a lot of ruckus out there throughout the media. Here is one example of this. That puts this entire case on life support. And Andrew Weissman is a former Trump prosecutor. And here's what he said about this when he was on MSNBC. ...itself from any criticism and then perhaps ruling that no, the president does not have full immunity. What is your sense of things, number one? And number two, how long this may delay the trial? Well, I'm very pessimistic. I do not have the view oh. that they took this case because they're going to hand out a win to Donald Trump in the Colorado case, but here they're going to essentially give him a defeat by saying there is no presidential immunity in this case. Yes, of course, I think ultimately they will not grant. Right. I agree with that. Some people were making the argument that there was going to be this split. Okay. SCOTUS is going to accept both cases and they're going to say the Colorado ballot case is dismissed. That's a stupid case, but immunity doesn't apply. So prosecute him there, right? Kind of split it. I don't think so. I think he's going to be two for two on this. It's immunity in this case, but they have given him the win because the DC case, That's right. let's just face it, is on life support now. It is really, oh. really hard to figure out how this case gets to trial before the election. And I think that's the, the end result of what they did here. So Heartache. they may ultimately say that yeah. he does not have immunity, but in fact, he will be have been given immunity because the case will not go to trial before the election. Meaning if Joe- Meaning the case, he has immunity because the case is not gonna go to trial before the election. Because we're just going through due process because we have millions of pages of documents in here, because we have a lot of novel legal issues of law. Biden win.
wins, the case goes forward. But if he loses, the case is over. I think it's worth noting the other sort of big picture item is any normal politician, any person who was accused of a crime that they did not do would want to clear his name. And ridiculous. so what's happening here- Totally ridiculous, right? Why would you ever, ever even agree to that? He's being prosecuted by a politicized, weaponized DOJ, and he's not giving any time for this. So put a pin in this, okay? Because he's gonna make the argument that Trump should just wanna walk in there, just walk, waltz right in there and, hey, try me with whatever evidence you have. I'm innocent. Totally ridiculous. And this is an old trope about all defendants. That, well, if you're so innocent, why don't you just go to trial? Man, because the government is corrupt and we have the presumption of innocence. You have the burden of proof and we have the right to due process and equal protection under the law and we're gonna use it. So don't tell us, you know, to just like race in there and go play ball with Jack Smith. It's totally unfair. They've got millions of dollars. They got the whole DOJ. They've got endless money. They've got the power of the FBI and the defense has nothing. We have due process of law, that's it. And they're trying to even take that away. So it's a ridiculous trope. We'll come back to that. Is the reason one thinks it's a win for Donald Trump is he's trying to avoid at all costs the facts of what happened that are charged in this indictment that they do not get presented in court where facts actually matter and people will hear it. So he can continue to matter, say publicly, this is all just a smear campaign by his political adversary but, and avoid it actually is. having this confronted by the a jury to assess those claims that he's making publicly. So you guys could have brought this case a long time ago and you chose not to do that. You chose to wait to try to time it in an election year and now you're freaked out because Jack Smith has dropped the ball on it. Trump has validly appealed these issues and the cases were garbage from the get-go, okay? This is why presidents haven't been prosecuted in 234 years because it's not logical to do it, but they are so freaked about Trump winning that they have no other options. So this is another clip from MSNBC and then we're gonna respond to this. There's a great thread from another attorney, but this is some ideas on what the possible timeline might look like from this woman, Lisa Rubin. She's another, I think, attorney who has covered this case a lot from MSNBC. Let's see what they say. Remaining, when Donald Trump's case was paused to allow for further consideration of the immunity issue, there were 88 days left to trial. Judge Chutkin has publicly committed herself to giving Donald Trump around seven months to prepare for trial. So we have to assume that she takes that 88 day remainder she will. fairly seriously. She, will. she has also said, including through a pre questionnaire that went out to prospective jurors in the Washington area that this is a trial that will take around three months. So you have to build into the calendar that 88 days plus 90 days to try the case if you think that this is going to happen before the election. And thinking. that's why folks like me are asking the Supreme Court, why didn't you write like you're running out of time? Because time is quickly elapsing here. No, no, no. That's your time, okay? That's not everyone else's time. It's your time. They're on a whole different clock than the rest of us. They think that everything is about this election and that we all got to get it settled before the election. They could have charged Trump immediately. We've already had Proud Boys trials. We've already had Oath Keepers trials. We've already had many J6 trials, many of them. They tried to time it and SCOTUS isn't playing ball with them, okay? Nobody is as freaked out as they are about this and nobody has to play by their clock, but nice try. There are folks who believe that the Supreme Court could rule quickly after the April 22nd oral argument. Our friend Neil Kotchow, for example, is one who believes that the court will render a ruling by sometime in early May. On the other hand, if you believe that the court is likely to push this decision until the end of the term in June, which usually ends at the very end of June or July 1st, like our friend Judge Michael Ludig, then you're really in a crunch with respect to the calendar and if and when a trial can begin. There is also finally the question of Department of Justice policy. I've heard a number of folks on our air and other places say, well, wait a second, the Department of Justice prohibits taking steps in a case like yeah, this but it's Trump. 60 to 90 days before an election. That's not my understanding of DOJ policy, which prohibits overt investigative steps, not the trying of a case, but more. <laughs> so they're going to find a way to wiggle out of their own rule. Like we can start a trial like in what, October, like October 30th, maybe be a good date to start. Importantly, the Department of Justice won't be in control of when this case is tried. That will be up to Judge Tanya Chetkin if and when the case is returned to her. And in that instance, I believe that Judge Chetkin would proceed even if we are well into general election territory at that point. She would. I totally agree with that 100%. Chutkin will put this case to start a trial on November 3rd. Okay, I don't know what day that is, but she'd do it, right? Trial starts, jury selection, let's go. Because this is the end game. This is everything that they are building up to do. And there are incredible comments out there. And the best one is the why so serious comment. Why so serious? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, we got, how about a reality check, okay? Before we listen to some of these other wackos melt down and hear Judge Luddig talk like he's on 0.25 speed. We got this nice summary, okay? They're all freaked out about the timeline. Weissman and Lisa Rubin all freaked out. Oh, why are they going so slow? Relax, everybody. All right, this is from Dylan Esper. And he's a litigator and he's an attorney and he does appeals. Now, appellate lawyers are different breed. It's different. And I'm not an appellate lawyer, right? I was in the day-to-day -day stuff. If we had to do appeals, we went and found people to do those who were excellent at appeals. It's a whole different ballgame. So this is a beautiful summary of what's going on. And I don't get the sense that this guy's like an ultra MAGA Trumper. So, but here's what he says. The courts are slow walking Trump's immunity claim narrative. For the most part, that's coming from non-lawyers who don't understand anything about the system is truly angering me. So here's the real story. He says, look, President Trump was indicted last August, 2023. That's not long ago. Notably, that's the biggest slow walk of all. An August 2023 indictment for a January 2021 alleged crime is insane. And it was 10 months after Jack Smith was appointed. But apparently Smith is a saint among men and quote, on our team. Okay, so I think this guy's like on that team. So Jack Smith, he says, cannot be criticized. And so shout out to this dude for criticizing someone on his own team. He says, President Trump's motion to dismiss, it was filed on September 29th. So August indictment, motion to dismiss less than two months, okay, after the case commenced, which is crazy, super fast. And we were still talking about discovery, like 13 million pages, 8 million pages. They already had a motion to dismiss, crazy. Now, Judge Chutkin, the J6 judge, who again gets no criticism because again, she's on the right team, decided it on December 1st. So she waited two months. And nonetheless, to be clear, she says Judge Chutkin deserves no criticism for this. I mean, two months from filing to decision on a motion to dismiss in federal court is very fast. Like that's rapid speed. Whoa. Usually you're looking at six months or more, but Chutkin dropped everything. Like, ah, let's go. Cause they're freaking out. The clock is ticking. That's like, wow, like way fast. So this case was then expedited. And he says, you know, Trump had a right under the law, which they don't, you know, most people don't care about on the blue team anymore. He had the right under the law to appeal this ruling to the court of appeals and to stay the trial court proceedings while he did it. Now you may not like this rule, but it applies to anyone, anyone raising an immunity defense, not just Trump. Now, President Trump took his appeal and the court concluded briefing in just one month, one month for all of that. And then they held oral arguments on January 9th and decided the case February 6th. This is lightning fast. Most court of appeals cases take about a year to a year and a half between commencement and conclusion, a year to a year and a half at the court of appeals. And further, the DC court of appeals itself broke a norm to speed up the case even further. And nobody even criticized it for breaking this norm. Why'd they do that? It's a technical issue, but the mandate is the date on which the court of appeals judgment when it goes into effect. In a normal case, if you're like a normal defendant and you're not Trump, which is below the law all over the place, he's constantly below the law, like way below. You get 15 days in a normal case to petition the court to rehear the case in case some error was made, right? 15 days, or to suggest that the full court, the court of appeals, rather than the three judge panel, this was the en banc, that they get to hear the case. And then the decision takes effect seven days after that. And But guess what? The 15 plus the seven, that's 22 days, right? Wrong. Sorry, Trump, you don't get it. The DC circuit panel took those 22 days away from President Trump. Again, he's below the law. You don't get those. It did so even though we have no idea if the full DC circuit panel, the en banc, actually might have wanted to even hear the case. And now we don't have that at all because SCOTUS has just taken it. But it doesn't matter, said the panel at the Court of Appeals. We're not even going to let you make that request. The decision takes effect immediately. And so President Trump was forced to file immediately to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, even here, his time was cut. When you're even with a law, normally you get three months to file a petition to the Supreme Court. The D.C. Circuit gave President Trump a week, one week, three months, a week, once again, is below the law. Again, enormous speed, crazy. President Trump then filed his application to SCOTUS to take the case on February 12th. SCOTUS then, then they decided within 16 days to grant the application. It's like, whoa. And then SCOTUS set a highly expedited briefing schedule. It says normally a case that is taken by SCOTUS on February 28th will be briefed all through 
through the summer and the spring. It'll be heard in October when the new term starts and it would be decided the following January. That's next year, 2025, in a normal case. If Trump was at the law, we would be having this conversation a year from now, but we're not because he's below. But SCOTUS held all the briefings will be done by April. Again, insane. And it will only, it will be orally argued the week of 422. That sets up for a decision in early May. A motion that was filed, okay, just to be clear, a motion to dismiss, which was filed in September, goes through all three levels of the federal court system and it gets decided by May. That's fast. You want to know what regular order looks like? Well, Judge Chutkin takes six months to rule on a motion to dismiss and she rules on it the last week of March 2024. The DC Circuit Appeal takes a year and it's decided in March 2025. Throw on another month for the en banc denial. Trump's petition for certiorari to the Supreme Court hits in spring 2025, okay? And his petition is granted. The case is briefed in the summer and the early fall. It's argued November 2025 and then it's decided in March 2026. That's what regular order looks like. This case has been expedited by almost two years, but still the Weissmans and the Rubens and all the rest of them, they all just cried from the, I can't believe it. And this is absolutely right, by the way. Look at any other case in the Supreme Court. Just go back and rewind the clock. Go find when the case started. It's years ago. You have complex drug cases at felonies at local at state levels that take two years. I've worked on many felonies that were drug crimes that were minor crimes that were years long cases because of what's required. Designated complex, continuance is all over the place. It takes forever. And those are like minor cases that don't have 13 million pages of documents for crying out loud. So the fact that we've gotten this fast has been insane, right? It's a violation of due process. We've been screaming about it forever. It is dumping all over his rights. He can't prepare. How can you defend yourself if you don't have any time to prepare the case? They've had years. Trump has had zero. And if you want to argue that a 524 decision is still too late, well, SCOTUS only controls the last three months of that delay. And so the rest of it, blame the liberal Judge Chutkin and the D.C. Circuit, and especially the DOJ, the DOJ didn't bring this case for two and a half years. They waited because they wanted to hit it in the middle of an election. They did it intentionally. Says, seriously, the court system took almost two years off a case that the DOJ took two and a half years to bring. It's disgusting. The Supreme Court itself took eight months off the case, and we're blaming the Supreme Court? This is utterly wrong. The reality is once the DOJ decided it would take two and a half years to bring the J6 charges, the goose was cooked. And that is the case, even though the federal courts, including SCOTUS, tried to pull it out of the oven quicker at the end. Boom. What an awesome thread. Okay, very grateful for that thread. Shout out to Dylan Esper. Please follow this person at Dylan Esper, Dylan E-S-P-E-R on X. And of course, I retweeted it up there, reposted it. Sorry, Elon, don't ban me on the X platform. And so go give this dude a follow, right? Really great analysis and absolutely true. And we have been making this point for a long time here. Remember, in one of the original motions from Trump's defense, they said that Walmart versus Visa took like seven years to litigate and had like seven million pages. Trump had like 13 million pages and they wanted to get trial in March. Chutkin wanted trial in March. These people are psychopaths, all right? They are violating due process of the law. They are not giving the defense the fair opportunity to even defend themselves. And it's like the Count of Monte Cristo, man. It's disgusting behavior and they're doing it because of my Trump. It makes my blood boil. All right, now, even in spite of all that, okay, these whack jobs are still melting down because they want to use the power of the state to stop their political opponents. And let's listen to Rachel Maddow and watch how she hyperventilates over the sand grasping through her fingers. The court, as the Supreme Court of the United States and a rational actor and a decent one, that was a reasonable supposition and it just turns out they're not that. Yeah. Feel, you know, incremental bit of progress here. The important question here is not whether the Supreme Court is going to decide that Donald Trump and all presidents are immune from prosecution for things they commit, crimes they committed while they were president. I mean, it would be fully insane for them to actually side with Trump here, right? The con uh, No, it would not, actually. And it's not absolute immunity. And I get tired of this, right? It's absolute immunity. It's not. They impeached Trump for insurrection and they tried to convict him in the Senate and Congress failed. And that means under the impeachment judgment clause, Trump still has presidential immunity and he has every right in this country to have the process unfold legitimately ahead of him so he can try his case in court. Inclusion that we can arrive at now based on what they have done without having to wait for the ruling is that they are ensuring that Trump will not face trial. And when they inevitably rule that presidents aren't immune from prosecution after they leave office, what that when they inevitably say that they aren't immune will tell Donald Trump if by then he is president is that he can never uh, leave the office of the presidency. Uh, and if he is voted out in 2028, he cannot leave office. He is welcome to commit any crimes he wants to as long as he is still president in order to 
ignore the result of that election and stay in power for life because otherwise he is going to go to prison when he gets out. Okay, so now, do, if you, you think do you see how logically idiotic that is? It supports the argument as to why you need immunity, right? So if you grant a president immunity so that they're not under threat of constant prosecution, then we'll have more orderly power, right? Because if that's what happens now, if we have a system where if Trump leaves office and he gets prosecuted into oblivion, it's going to cause, right, a new incentive structure to be created. And that if we have that principle, right, where you can prosecute a president, okay, let's say Trump loses, Biden wins. What's going to stop Biden from leaving, dumb Rachel? Because he's going to be in the same position too, right? Or whoever the next president happens to be. Why would any president ever leave? Then they would be subject to prosecution. But they have no foresight, right? They can't lay down a rule. These are the same people saying that Trump will never leave who say he committed an insurrection and then left. Well, you just said he committed an insurrection and then he like packed up and left. So if he didn't do it back then when Congress was under attack or so-called, then why is he going to suddenly do it now? So they're just, I don't even know if they believe their own insanities. They don't think through it a whole lot. Like, okay, then that means Joe Biden's going like, to, it supports immunity. Her whole argument supports immunity, but she doesn't even see it. All right. Now here is, I think really what this is about. They're going to cry so hard when the Supreme Court comes out and says, you guys are whacked for trying to throw him off the ballot. You're on the ballot. You guys are whacked for trying to insurrect him. You already failed to do that. So he's on the ballot and he has immunity. Deal with it. All this is about is about delegitimizing the court. They do not want these six, you know, Republican justices, conservative justices up there. They want to minimize them. They've been working on this forever and they're laying the foundation for it. Here is this guy and this hairdo explaining how destroyed we are. And look at this Chiron back here. You see Donald Trump versus the United States. You see how they do that here? That's actually not the case name, right? I mean, maybe that's the appeal name. It's flipped around, but they try to frame it like Trump versus America. So, you know, these names flip around like the legal captions flip around based on the appeal, but they try to say Trump is attacking America, right? This is all being framed for political gain. And here's this very unwell individual here ranting. Then the appeals court gives a bulletproof ruling, as Dahlia says, and they still decide to take it up. What it says is that they are. It was not a bulletproof ruling from the D.C. Circuit, okay? Those three ladies didn't even want to sign their names. That's how bad the case was. And I'm tired of hearing that. And by the way, if the case was amazing, then SCOTUS would have just left it stand. And we would have known right then that there was no immunity. It was a beautiful case. They settled everything. But even their opinion was terrible. It was logically inconsistent. And whatever standards they set, right? The idea is we have to set a standard for Trump and the next guy and the next guy or a woman, whatever. We have to set the standard so it is eternal. We got to live with it. They don't think that way. They just want this case. They just want Trump like destroyed. Whatever the collateral consequences of that are can be damned. But they didn't even sign their name to the opinion, right? These are all like one-off individual attacks and they haven't articulated the bigger thesis. And that's what SCOTUS is going to do. Corrupted political actors who act in bad faith. The reason why people like Mark and people like Dahlia seem to have a crystal ball is because they're real, because they're realists and they understand the court for what it is. And at some point, people in the media, people at home and people sitting in the White House have to stop pretending that the Supreme Court is some kind of benign trying to do its best institution and start to realize that there are six Republicans, not conservatives, Republicans on the Supreme Court who view it as their job to help the Republican Party. And until we do something about that, until we take away that power, until we draw the line on them there, they will continue to do this. They will help Trump. They will take away abortion rights. They will end affirmative action. They will liberalize gun rights. They will do all of it until we stop them. And somebody, somebody needs to start listening in the higher echelons of the Democratic Party because we will keep losing every day. We allow these six Republicans in robes to rule over all of us. Wow. So he's very upset about that, isn't he? So somebody needs to do something about those Supreme Court judges or else we're all going to die. Everything's going to fall apart, right? They are freaked out. They're freaked out because they know that this is their last gasp. They're doing everything they can to stop him. And if the Supreme Court is not going to let the J6 case go to trial because they're actually reviewing it, all is lost for them. Here is Judge Luddick. We'll only listen to about a little bit of this because I know we can only tolerate so much. He speaks at 0.25 speed like molasses spilling out of a can. Immunity case. Well, thank you for having me with you this afternoon, Nicole. I'm just hearing this this moment. <laughs> I just heard it in my ear. As we... Look, this is a momentous decision just to hear this case. There was no reason in this world for the Supreme Court to take this 
case, the three-judge panel of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia had written a masterful opinion. It was terrible. They didn't even sign it. Denying that the, uh, the president's claims of absolute immunity. Under the Constitution and the laws of the United States, there's never been an argument that a former president is immune from prosecution for crimes that he committed while in office. On the more practical level... There's no course, precedent because uh, it's never been prosecuted. The court is, Supreme Court is capable of deciding this very quickly in time that the former president could be tried before the election. But today's decision makes that that much more unlikely. Oh. Just explain that for <laughs> Oh, no. I wrote, if they had refused to hear it, the appeals court ruling would have held. Would have gone trial, back to Chutkin. Judge Tanya Chutkin could have scheduled her trial. Yes, and that's what I had expected <laughs> the court to do, as had many other... Well, you were wrong, okay? We all knew you were wrong. You guys are wrong constantly. I don't know why anybody listens to these guys, actually. They said the same thing about the Supreme Court Colorado case. They said that, you know, that was beautiful. Democrats in Colorado did an amazing job, and there's nothing else to even think about on that one. Yep, they accepted it. And even the lefty judges, even Kitanji, was like, well, this is kind of ridiculous. It says no president in that list, so why doesn't it say it, you know? And there was a, a lot there, but they're dead wrong again. SCOTUS obviously accepted it because that opinion from the unsigned judges, apparently it wasn't so masterful there, Judge. Observers of the Supreme Court. That's why it is very significant that the court has decided to take the case and hear it. Oh man, they're all so depressed about it. It's just beautiful to watch. Well, maybe you should actually think about the Constitution and about the format of our structure of government before you guys just start filing a bunch of insane motions and insane prosecutions that are not based in the law. Don't prosecute based on politics and you wouldn't be here so depressed. But of course, this is good news. We're going to be here continuing to cover this. We do have briefs that are scheduled coming out very soon from both sides. And when they drop, we're going to be covering them in depth. So my friends, thank you for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thanks for also checking out some of the links down in the description below. We do members only streams in the morning. We'd love to have you watching the watchers.locals.com. We have an amazing community and we do a lot of fun stuff, including Saturday shows. So come and join us. We also have watcherlodge.com, our sovereignty and self-development community linked below. And if you want to sign up for our daily newsletter, you can do that at robertgovea.com, all in the description. My friends, thanks for subscribing and liking this video. And thanks for inviting someone to come over here and join us when we go live. And we'll look forward to seeing you back here on the next one.